Well, let me share a couple of announcements with you, uh, if I may. Um, I'm going to reiterate what, what Jordan had said about the uh, special offering. Uh, please mark your envelope for that. It uh, goes for a very special cause. Is this the original carpet? I thought so, because I, I was here when you dedicated this building. And I remember it being blue. I didn't know if it was this blue or not, but yeah. So it's been in here a few years, folks. That's a great project, so why not please get behind that, if you would. And also, I did not say this last week, and my wife reprimanded me for this. Uh, need, to, need to say a thank you to the worship team for a great job that you guys do. You really do every week. Uh, thank you so much. And Dwayne, thank you so much this morning for the special number and the special numbers before we even started our worship officially. Thank you. And Marcio, I guess you and a small team of folks uh, did all the decorating here in the church. And that looks very, very beautiful as well. So thank you so much for all of that. Um, continue to remember Jordan and Matt as they lead the search committee and the board in, uh, in the uh, search for a pastor. So please uh, keep that in mind, make that a regular daily part of your prayer time. And then one other one that I had mentioned before that I'll mention again, and I'll mention it, I'm sure, a few more times beyond this, encouragement cards. Uh, they're out there in the lobby area, and I would encourage you to pick up some encouragement cards to be an encouragement to somebody, all right? You have no idea what a card with a few lines on it would mean to somebody. Uh, maybe, in fact, uh, you might want to just take a glance around the sanctuary. You know where people have sat as they have come to church each week. Uh, maybe that their spot is open right now. Nobody's sitting there because they're not here. Maybe a, a note to them would be a, a real encouragement. And I know that once this COVID stuff is behind us, hopefully that will really... Uh, you know, bring some of our folks. I, I understand there are 25, 30 people who are a part of the congregation who have intentionally chosen to stay away because of the virus, and that's totally understandable. But hopefully once that begins to pass, and it will pass, uh, these folks will come back. But in the meantime, send a card to somebody. It might be a tremendous encouragement to them. Uh, and then again, I would just simply say, uh, remember... Uh, to read your bulletin and all the other announcements that are included in that. This morning, I want you to find your Bibles and uh, turn with me to the uh, book of Luke once again. We're going to look at um, we're going to look at Luke chapter two. Uh, in fact, we'll cover some of the same verses we covered last week. Only, obviously, our emphasis will be different. I'm bringing this down so that uh, when it comes time, Jenny can read our scripture lesson uh, for us. But in Luke chapter 2, we're going to look this morning at, uh, at what the Bible has to say about what the Christmas story has to say about joy. Uh, I'm sure that as you look at the Christmas story uh, and you're picking out words uh, for that story, probably the word joy would be one of those words that you would, uh, you would normally associate with Christmas. And we're going to look at that this morning and what the Bible has to say about that. In fact, the, the, uh, the, the angel just didn't talk about joy. You might recall the angel talked about great joy. And there's a huge difference between the two of them. And uh, we'll look at that this morning. We're continuing this Advent series. Uh, next week will be our last uh, uh, lesson in the study. We're going to look at, the, of course, the greatest gift. We've been talking about gifts that the Lord gives to us during this Christmas time. And uh, we looked the first week at worship. We, we studied the wise men, the magi, uh, and them bringing their gifts to Jesus. We looked last Sunday at the shepherds, and we looked at the word peace and what that word means. And then this Sunday, we're going to look at the word joy, which is also found in this Luke passage. And the next week, we'll look at, uh, at the greatest gift, of course, that gift being Jesus, uh, the greatest gift that the Lord could possibly have given to us. By the way, what does Advent mean? Anybody know what that word means itself? We use it, we use it during the, the, the Christmas season, but it isn't just a word for Christmas. Anybody know what that word means? Arrival. Coming or arrival. That's why it's not just restricted to the Christmas season. It could be, we talk about Jesus' second Advent, 
when someday he's going to come back for his church. We talk about Christmas time being that first advent when he came into the world as a, as a small baby. Um, and it specifically refers to Jesus coming this first time. Uh, I, I would guess that uh, you would agree with me that, that, that there are people today, probably a whole bunch of people today, who really have lost focus when it comes to Christmas. Um, maybe even some sitting here this morning. Um, we, um, yeah, I was reminded of this this week. I was reading this week uh, uh, some letters that children had written to Santa. Uh, and uh, and uh, one of the children had, had, had written a letter that simply said, Dear Santa, you did not bring me anything good last year. You did not bring me anything good the year before that. This is your last chance. And it was signed by Alfred. That's losing focus, wouldn't you agree? And then I read another one that said, uh, Dear Santa, there are three little boys who live in our house. There is Jeffrey, he is two. There is David, he is four. And there is Norman, he is seven. Jeffrey is good some of the time. David is good some of the time. But Norman is good all of the time. And the letter is signed, Norman. <laughs> I, I, I read a more serious comment, though, this week also. A little child had written a letter to Santa. And this was the letter that she wrote. She said, I wish COVID was over so we can hug. And I imagine, again, some of you are huggers. I'm a hugger. Um, you know, if, appropriately, obviously. Um, and I see nothing wrong with that. I see nothing wrong with a good handshake. But all of that's sort of a taboo right now, and we don't want to go too far with that. Um, so, you know, a, a, as a Christian, it's, it's e even as a Christian, it is easy for us to lose focus on what Christmas really is all about. Even though we know what it's about. We come every Sunday to church, and we know what it's about. We, we hear it over and over and over again which sometimes can be a problem because we, we, we become so accustomed to hearing something, we don't really hear it. I mean, has that ever happened to you as a husband, wife? Uh, you know, it, you know you, someone, you know, your, your wife, my wife says something to me and I hear it, but I don't really hear it. And she has to let me know that I didn't hear it. And that's the way it is with all of us. That just happens. Um, and, and if we're not careful, we can, we can lose again that whole focus about what Christmas is all about. So if you were picking a word uh, that I've been picking words that, that describe Christmas these last couple of weeks. So if, if you were to, to, to say a word that would remind you of Christmas, what would that word be? It doesn't have to be sort of a spiritual, scriptural word. What would that be? Go ahead. Childhood. Oh, childhood, okay. What else? Togetherness. Family. Any others? You know, what, one word that I haven't heard that unfortunately is a part of Christmas is, I think, the word headache. <laughs> Seriously. Um, you know, there, there are those people who can hardly wait for Christmas to be over. Now, for some of them, there's a good just reason. Maybe they've had a tragedy in their family. And, and Christmas brings back all kinds of memories that they really don't want to focus on at that moment. Maybe as the Christmases come and go, that gets better. But there's always going to be that emptiness because of something that's happened in, in their family, in their particular life. Um, and for some people, it's just because there's just so much busyness, so much activity around Christmas that they, they're tired of the rush. They're tired of people tripping over one another. And yet as I thought about that, I thought, you know, how, how sad that is when, when this event called Christmas 
the birth of Jesus was brought so much joy to heaven. I mean, what were the what were the angels doing on the hillsides? Well, above the hillsides, they were praising the Lord. And as I mentioned to you last week, to me, it's almost it's almost um, uh, it's almost not understandable why the people could not in the town of Bethlehem, heard what was going out on the hillsides. They must have been so tuned in to their life that they totally missed out on what was happening. And that, again, can happen in our lives as well. All this rejoicing that was going on, not just by the angels, by the way, but by the shepherds and by the wise men. I want you to open your Bible, your phone app, whatever you're using, to Luke chapter 2, and I'm going to ask Jenny if she would come. Luke chapter 2, we're going to begin reading at verse 8 and read down through verse 14. Now I want you to notice as as she reads this, this passage of scripture, particularly verse 10, which I think is a critical verse. Thank you, Jenny. keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths, and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Again, that's that's the verse where you find that phrase, great joy. It wasn't just joy. There was great joy. Uh, The birth of Jesus 2,000 years ago caused great joy back then, and it still caused, that birth still causes great joy today. Here's the punctuation point. Here's the big idea that I want to wrap some thoughts around this morning. I would like to suggest to you that this Christmas season can be a time of great joy, regardless of circumstances, because joy is not just an emotion but also a decision. You can change your joy level as you choose to focus on Jesus. Let me wrap some thoughts around that. There's an acrostic I want to use this morning in this message. And it's, if you've worked with children, you probably have used this acrostic. Maybe you've, if you've worked with young people as well. Um, but if you really want to have joy this Christmas, real joy, let me suggest to you a, a formula in the form of an acrostic. And here it is. First of all, number one, let's focus on the J of joy, which stands for Jesus. It was the Apostle Paul who uh, wrote to the the, the churches in the Galatia area, and he said to them, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, all of us have probably watched the the classic uh, Christmas special, A Charlie Brown Christmas. Anybody has not seen that? It's been on, it's it's, it's on every Christmas time, uh, I don't know for how many years now, but Charlie Brown is really concerned because, you know, it seems to him that people have forgotten what Christmas is all about. And so he asks, if anyone knows what Christmas is all about, because, because even his friends, even his own dog seems to have missed it. It didn't understand what it was all about. In fact, his dog in the story, you might recall, had decorated his dog house and he had, you know, he had lights and he had a, a little, you know, flashing lights and a little topper and, and, uh, and he got a blue medal, a blue ribbon for his, uh, for his work. And, and so, so, so Charlie Brown is all concerned about this. How, how come we, we've forgotten what Christmas is all about? 
And, and, and he asks, does anybody know what it's all about? And Linus, you might recall, um, Lucy's brother, um, answers Charlie Brown by reciting the story of Jesus' birth from Luke chapter 2. Let's watch just a, something so simple, right? You know, the, the, the birth of a baby, which obviously was transformative, uh, yet could be, could be lost somehow in all of, all of the activity that was going on. We, we, we forget sometimes that Christmas is simply about Jesus. And it's so simple to forget about Jesus. You've all seen the phrase, a bumper sticker, wherever it might be that says, he is the reason for the season. See, as a Christian, focusing on Jesus means not only remembering the child in the manger in Bethlehem, but also the Savior that lives in our hearts. You know, we remember that this baby became an adult. We know that. We read the gospel story. And, and he went to the cross and he died and, and he was placed in a grave and he rose again so that we might experience new life. And so today, he lives in our hearts, in the heart of every Christian. And that gives us unbelievable and indescribable joy. See, the Bible says that you will find joy by focusing on Jesus. But then second, let's also focus on the O of the joy, which stands for others. The Apostle Paul was speaking to the church, the elders of the church at Ephesus for the last time. And you find the story there in the book of Acts chapter 20. And as he's, as he's talking with them, he's recounting his ministry among them. And, and his work in, in their city. He was there for about three years. And a church was raised up in that, uh, in that town. And he says to the elders, In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself, who said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. You see, focusing on Jesus should help us develop an attitude of joy that's found in Acts chapter 20 and verse 35. Now, I don't know why Paul quoted Jesus. I mean, I think I know why he did, but why at this particular time, I'm not really sure, except maybe he wanted to point out to these elders the importance of generosity and the joy of generosity. Because as we look at Jesus' life, that's what his life was all about. It was all about generosity. I mean, consider the stories that you find in the four Gospels. You know, the, the healing of blind Bartimaeus on the side of the road, the, the feeding of the 4,000 and the 5,000 people, uh, the transformation that took place in the, in the lives of, of two tax collectors, you know, Matthew and Zacchaeus, or that time when he drove out the seven demons from Mary Magdalene, who became one of his close followers. Or maybe that forgiveness that he extended to that sinful woman in, in, uh, in the book of Luke, chapter 7, who had slipped into the home of Simon the Pharisee. He wasn't supposed to be there. And yet Jesus touched her and made her different. Or that time when he cleansed those ten lepers and... Nine of them never came back to thank him, but the one did. And there are all these stories that you find about, about Jesus' generosity, taking time to talk with a, with, a, with a Samaritan woman at the well. Things that he, you know, he would not have had to have done those things. But I think that Jesus did those things to give us an example that we should follow. And Christmas is the time that we celebrate the Lord giving the most wonderful gift of all. And that gift, of course, being Jesus. You know, his Son, our Savior. And so, his reason for giving Jesus to the world was because of his love for other people. And by his giving, he shared with us an example that we should follow. Uh, it seems to me that, that only temporary joy comes from getting but lasting joy 
comes from giving. See, it's, the, it's this pure focus on others. When there is no personal ulterior motive that will bring to us real and lasting joy. See, if you truly want to know the joy of Christmas, then discover what it means to give. Um, we've been reminded of the Advent offering for the carpet. Jordan has also mentioned the other projects that there are in the bulletin that you can be a part of. You'll find a need, whatever that need is, and in the name of Jesus, reach out and help. You know, give, give liberally, and when you do, you'll be helping people who are in need, people that you probably will never meet in your lifetime. But that's not important. It's people that we can touch through the name of Jesus. And there are plenty of people in need who in the name of Jesus, we can help. So I think the Bible says that you will find joy by focusing on Jesus first and then others second. And then look at the third one. The why of joy stands for yourself. And of course, that spells out the word joy. Uh, In just a moment, I'll read a couple of verses of Scripture to you. I don't think it's wrong to focus on yourself because your attitude does influence whether or not you'll experience joy. I'm not saying you should always focus only on yourself, not at all. But, um, But there's nothing wrong with us, you know, taking care of ourselves. You can let worry or you can let... Um, the withholding of forgiveness or, or discouragement or, or other things to rob you of joy during the, the Christmas season and beyond. But it's your choice. See, you choose what attitude is going to rule in your life. Nobody else can force that attitude onto you. That is your choice. So here are a couple of verses I want to give to you. One is Philippians 4 and verse 6. Paul is addressing the church, and he says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Now, what is Paul saying there? What is he saying to these people at Philippi? My guess is that there were some people at Philippi who were holding on to things. They weren't releasing them. And we can have, maybe do have, the same problem today. We hang on to stuff rather than choosing to give those problems away to the Lord. The Apostle Peter had some great counsel. He wrote this. He said, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God and that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. So if I'm reading what Paul writes to the Philippians and what Peter writes to these scattered Christians... Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I come to the conclusion that, that I'm a fool if I choose to hold on to my stuff, whatever it is. Things are going to drag me down. You know, I, I am I'm foolish to do that when the Lord has extended to me this invitation to give whatever it is to Him. And we need to do that. Ephesians 4.32 Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ forgave you. We we make a choice whether or not we will forgive someone who has maybe hurt us. And I would would venture to say, if I were a betting person, and I'm not, but if I were, I would say there's not a person in this room this morning who hasn't had somebody hurt them in some way. And maybe that hurt is still deep. Maybe you've not been able to get beyond it. But I think what Paul is saying in in Ephesians 4.32 is that we make the choice of whether or not we'll forgive someone who has offended us. And Jesus taught us this, did he not? I mean, Jesus taught us to forgive. Peter comes to him and says, Lord, and I'm guessing that somebody had offended Peter, and maybe he had done it several times. 
And so he said, Lord, how many times do I have to forgive someone who has offended me? And the Lord, and he said, seven times, which he thought was maybe a good number. And the Lord said, no, Peter, but 70 times seven. Not 490, but just keep on doing it. Keep on forgiving people who offend you, even if it's the same person. But we make that choice of whether or not we're going to extend forgiveness to someone who has hurt us in some way. Then I think of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, where Paul writes, May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us a eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. We make the decision again whether or not we're going to allow the Lord's encouragement to fill us. He promises to do that if we'll allow him to do it. And who doesn't want the encouragement of God in their life? So when I look at these several verses that I've given to you this morning, I, I see a pattern here of, of how we can experience real and lasting joy in our life. See, the Bible says that you'll find joy by focusing on Jesus first. That's number one. That's paramount. And then others second, and yourself last. And here's the takeaway. I think the reality is you can be full of faith or full of doubt. You can be full of the Lord's joy or full of the world's sorrow. It's your choice. So consider your thoughts. Listen to your words. Watch your actions. Then ask yourself, am I demonstrating the Lord's joy in my life? The foundation of Christmas is giving and, that, and one of the Christmas gifts that the Lord extended to us is this matter of joy. The angel says to the shepherds, I bring you tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people, A-L-L, -L, all people, all of us can experience this wonderful joy because of this baby that was placed in a feeding trough who was tightly wound with strips of cloth outside that, you know, that sleepy little town of Bethlehem. God has gifts for each of us. And one of those gifts is joy. And joy is experienced when we focus on Jesus, others, and yourself, which spells out that word joy. So, so I encourage you not to wait until December 25th. Don't wait until a week from this Friday to unwrap this great gift, but rather, rather accept this gift that God has given to you and begin experiencing the joy of the Lord in your life. And if you're experiencing the joy of the Lord, experience it in even a higher level for us to express this joy that we have in Jesus that we've been looking at this morning. I want us to turn on the hymnal to number 170. I'll invite the worship team to come back up. And we're going to sing this song that is familiar to all of us, Joy to the World. And this is going to be a, a closing statement of faith for us. Sing this heartily as unto the Lord this morning.